by now when you feel a little prayer as your heart and you will find a little talk when Jesus makes it right alright and I may have doubts and fears my eyes be filled with tears but Jesus is a friend who watches day and night when I go to him in prayer he knows my every care well I am just a little talk when Jesus makes it right now let us have a little talk with Jesus and let us tell him all about our trouble he will hear our faintest cry and he will answer by and by now when you feel it has your heart you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right don't you know it's alright 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 just a little talk with Jesus makes it right It's alright. It's alright. It's alright. It's alright. Right. And just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Alright, now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our trouble. And he will hear our faintest cry. And he will answer. By and by now when you feel a prayerful yearning as your heart you will find a little talk with Jesus makes it right. So let's sing a couple of verses of Oh I Want to See Him. As I journey through the land, singing as I go, we're pointing so to Calvary, the real, the crimson flow, will many arrows pierce my soul from without, within, but my Lord leads me on and through. Him I must win. Well, now, oh, I want to see him. Look upon his face. He ain't not there to sing forever. Lord of his saving grace. Well, I'm on the streets of glory. Glory, let me lift up my voice. All of my cares I'll be whole will ever to rejoice now when in service for my Lord dark may be the night uh -huh. then I'll cling more close to him he will give me light and Satan stairs may vex my soul turn my thoughts aside, but my Lord goes ahead and leaves. Oh, Lord, and oh, I want to see him, yeah, look upon his face, hey, and there to sing forever, oh, Lord, of his sake. Of glory, glory, let me lift up my voice. All of my cares, I'll be home. Will it rejoice? 
now when in service for my Lord dark may be the night hey then now cling more close to him he will get me lie world and Satan snares may vex my soul turn my thoughts aside he just did but my Lord go his face hey, and there to sing forever oh Lord oh, oh, oh you know I'm on the streets of glory yeah let me lift up my voice cause all of my cares I'll be home If you didn't come to praise the Lord, you came to the wrong place. And we won't be sleeping or taking naps tonight. Amen, somebody. Amen. We're in revival. We are celebrating God's goodness, his grace, and his mercy. Amen. Amen. Now, I don't need to introduce our speaker tonight. He did that last night. <laughs> he did that by himself. Now, I asked him what song did he want to sing, and he said, well, he didn't say anything, but well, you already know. But he is going to sing a song on his own. He comes from a singing family. Y'all heard his brother on yesterday. And uh, we're going to have him back. Amen. We're going to have him back. Yeah. And so uh, I made sure he wasn't worshiping with his brother uh, down there at the Cedar Valley Church. So uh, we'll, we'll have him back. Good to see fellow ministers in the area. Uh, and then we got uh, a constituency uh, from the Inland Empire uh, in the place called Paris Valley. And uh, Reverend Dr. Good, 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 good Pastor Prewitt is in the house. Raise your hand. Good to have you. And then I got my cowboy buddy here. We, boy, this is my cowboy, Johnny Davis, AKA, uh huh, <laughs> Curly Bill, <laughs> Doc Holiday. Yeah. Texas Jack, Turkey Jack Jackson, yeah. And then good to see Elle Page again tonight. And then a uh, longtime friend and, and, and singer, uh, Ernest Garrett, uh, they all come in from the Inland Empire. I live out in that area. I'm still trying to figure out where they got the empire thing from. It is definitely inland, but that empire thing highly overrated. <laughs> and very questionable. <laughs> On your feet, y'all know that God is a good God. Look at your neighbor and say, God is a good God. God is a good God. God is a good God. And that's will never change. change the world. God is a good God. Oh Lord, and that's why I praise His name. Oh, I say God. Why I 
praise his name one more time saying God yeah good God oh Lord and that will no 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 God God is a good God oh Lord and that's why I praise his name one more time saying God
is His holy name. Amen. Amen. If God has been good to you this evening, say amen. amen. Truly, God has blessed all of us. And it is because of Him that we're able to be here tonight. Uh, he has been a good God. Uh, he's been a kind God. He's been a gracious God. He's been a merciful God. And I know that many of us have made the sacrifice tonight after a long day of work uh, to come here tonight to hear what he has to say to the church. Uh, and we want to thank you for coming out. Thank you for being here tonight to support this revival. You look at that prefix, re, means to do again, uh, to revive us, to rejuvenate us, to refocus us, to refresh us. Uh, and sometimes we think we've lost it, but we really didn't lose it. We just need our batteries recharged. Uh, we need to be reconnected, re-inspired, uh, and rededicate ourselves to the cause on which many of us fell in love with years ago. And I think it's, it's, it's safe to say tonight that you still got a lot of miles left on that car. You still got a lot left in the tank. And it's just a blessing to be here at Figueroa. Uh, last night we had a wonderful night. And uh, I pray that something was said uh, as I, I, I got hijacked by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that's always interesting when that happens, when, when he takes over the sermon. And then there's what you thought you were going to say and what he knows needs to be said. Yes, sir. So we don't apologize for what we said. Uh, we thank God that he is still working in this place. 80 years, what a magnificent celebration. And I think someone mentioned it Sunday, I think it's important to know that uh, 80 years without a split, uh, that's amazing these days and time. And that means that God has been with you. I always say carnal people, uh, spiritual people don't split churches. Uh, and it takes carnality. Carnality has to be present uh, where people have made it about them and not about God. So it's impossible for the spirit to split a church because the spirit only works in line with the will of God. And so tonight, we're here to celebrate this great congregation, but more importantly, we're, we're here to celebrate the Word of God. And so I'm humbled to your fine minister, Brother Hawkins, for the invitation, Dr. Holmes, all of the elders and the members here who uh, we just known throughout the years. I'm so glad to be here on tonight, and there's no other place that I would rather be here tonight. I saw that the Ram Stadium is coming along nicely. Uh, it'll probably be the second best stadium behind Cowboys Stadium uh, in, in the country uh, when everything is, is, is said and done. It might sit uh, on ha in half of Jerry World, uh, but uh, we still look forward to seeing what those, those Rams are going to do. Somebody said, brother, don't start nothing tonight. Just go ahead and, and, and get to it. But I realize there really are a lot of Cowboy fans in, in Los Angeles uh, anyway. Uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and deal with that elephant in the room and get that out of the way. Uh, we want to say it's good to see all of you from sister congregations who have come out to support this church and good to see all of the ministers and the guests, Brother Stokes. And uh, it was always uh, kind to me and, and he, he and Sister Stokes and just good to see them as well as all of you. And I don't have time to go in the name and also just glad I mean, my wife is sitting right there and my kids, I, when I can't get a uh, you know, I, I can look at her face if, if I feel everything else is off. And just, she's smiling like, go ahead, you got it. <laughs> or if she's like, you need to sit down, you know, one of, one of the two. But, uh, but I'm so glad that she's here tonight, and I'm glad that they're with me on, on this particular uh, trip. Uh, last night, we talked about the courage to cross over. Uh, and tonight, I said I, I wanted to go to the New Testament. And I know on Sunday, uh, Dr. Curl, Dr. Backus dealt with uh, the crossover and the stones, and I was telling Brother Curl, I, I actually got an idea uh, for our homecoming this year from his lesson, and it's going to be called, There's a Stone for That. Uh, and, and whatever you've gone through in your life, and tonight I really want to uh, uh, make some encouragement, but also uh, to uh, get us to uh, look at uh, how the gospel really transforms our lives. And I often say, if we want a revival in the church, what we need is a return. We're always talking about the first century church in Acts chapter 2, but we don't fellowship from house to house. Uh, the church increased uh, because of the fellowship, because there was adherence to the teaching of the word and a reverence for God's word. And I know we live in a society where things change. Maybe I'm just kind of old fashioned, but some of y'all remember a time when a young man used to open a door for a young lady and 
Chivalry wasn't dead, and we had respect for one another. When people came to the church, there wasn't a passion and excitement about homecomings and about fellowship and about singing and about hearing the word of God. And now I think we have too many distractions in our lives to really hear what God has in store for us. And so tonight, uh, I, I think that the gospel is one that heals us. And oftentimes in the, uh, in the New Testament, in the gospels, you often see where there was a fractured man. And what I mean man, a mankind, a fractured man and a flawed system which produced a frustrated savior. Uh, and we see that all of us have flaws in here tonight. I say where I preach all the time, we ought to lose our self-righteousness. Matter of fact, we have people walking around thinking that the next mistake they make is going to send them to hell. I got news for you. You've already done enough to go to hell. Uh, your rap sheet is already in line. You've done enough. But if God wanted to take you out, he would have taken you out already. So this thing is not about self-righteousness that comes from self-dependency and upon what your works and what you've done. We only saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, and the closer I get to him, him, I understand this more and more, and I, I can't parade my righteousness. I'm like the Apostle Paul. I am what I am by the grace of God. And if I am anything today, if you and I are anything, if this congregation is anything, it's only because of the grace of God. I'm just a, a fractured man who tries to maneuver through these flawed systems. Uh, and sometimes uh, what we call churches are just flawed systems. Uh, and I believe we have a frustrated Savior who's looking in on a lot of our places because uh, we have put the, we got the, the letter of the law, but we don't have the spirit of the law. And so we have uh, ended up running a lot of folks off, destroying a lot of people, tearing them down, trying to maintain our systems. And when the church is really about relationships, our love for God and how we treat each other. Matter of fact, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples by how many buildings you build, how many church vans you got riding around here. But by this shall all men know that you are my disciples by the love that you display, demonstrate, and have one for another. I think wrong ideas about God are in themselves false gods. And I want, I want to read Mark chapter 7 tonight. Let's, let's go to Mark chapter 7. And, and the way I'm going to go, you know how it is. You, you, you preach different types of lessons. Some are more expository, some are more topical. Uh, and as I said last night, I'm not here this week to try to impress anybody. I'm here to persuade you. Uh, Paul says, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So I'm trying to persuade you to think. And I pray tonight that you would have an open mind and a receptive heart uh, to what the word of God is going to say uh, here tonight. Uh, in Mark chapter 7, I just want to read 13 verses and then I'm going to go on with my lesson. The Bible says, then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him having come from Jerusalem. I had a sermon back in the day. Remember Jess Foxworthy had a series called You Might Be a Redneck If... I did a series called You Might Be a Pharisee If. Uh, and I believe we have a lot of modern day Pharisees in the church. And I'm going to leave that right, right there just for, for now. Verse number two, the Bible says, Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. Do you know anybody in the church who constantly finds fault? For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they came oh, from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. Then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk? according to the, and I want to note, tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands. And he answered unto them, well, Isaiah, prophecy of you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. I got to stop and make a note right there. Be careful that you do not profess what you do not possess. We have a lot of people who are professing things that they do not possess. He says in verse number seven, and in vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. 
for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold your tradition of men, the washing of pitchers, cups, and many other such things you do. And he said to them, all too well, all too often, you reject the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. Verse number 10, for Moses said, honor your father and your mother. He who curses his mother or father, let him be put to death. But you say, if a man say to his father or mother, whatever profit you, you might receive from me is Corban, that is a gift of God, then you no longer let him do anything, his father or mother, making the word of God, and I want you to take emphasis in this in verse number 13, making the word of God of no effect. The word of God cannot work. It's not, it's not profitable because your tradition is in the way. Oftentimes, it is tradition that is handed down, and many such things you do. I said this last night, I am a man of moderation. I like to stay down the middle. As God told Joshua, you don't go too far to the left, and don't go too far to the right, and stay with the word. And I'm convinced in the church, uh, we're good at not taking away. But one problem that we have is we add a whole lot of stuff that ain't even there. We place a whole lot of burdens upon men and women's shoulders that, that do not exist. Uh, and even this idea of working out one's salvation, working out one's salvation doesn't mean you're working trying to get saved. If you look what the Apostle Paul says, he says you work because you are already saved. In other words, uh, we don't abuse the grace of God. Paul says in Galatians, you use the grace to serve and to love one another. And so God has saved us uh, in order for us to experience, as Paul says, there is liberty in Christ. Where the freedom of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so I'm convinced that some of us don't know our liberty. And I believe wrong ideas about God are themselves false gods. They are idols just as much as a graven image. Uh, many of us have submerged ourselves so deep into the American dream that we've forgotten what we were called to be. We have developed a host of false gods that have skewed our perspectives about what's really important in this life. False ideas and assumptions that tell us things like America is always right or America first. Uh, we develop these ideas such as our sins are less sinful than other Christians and you have to look, act, or sound like me to be successful. You know, one thing I say about sin, sin always looks worse on other folks. Uh, yeah, 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 your sin is not as bad as some other folks' sins. Uh, and Paul says sometimes we're guilty of the very same things that we judge other folks of. We judge other folks' kids and other folks' lives and other folks how they give and, how, and we're guilty of the same things and I believe tonight all of the false gods need to replace be replaced by the one true God who comes to us uh, through the teachings and the example and the power of Jesus of Nazareth I believe the so short course in Christianity can be spelled out in a few words tonight and that is Jesus is God he is the Lord he is the one who has come down uh, from glory to reveal himself to human beings Jesus the God man God in a body, God in human flesh, God as a baby, God as a carpenter, a Jewish healer, a crucified, falsely accused criminal, a risen conqueror, a reigning king. And I want to challenge you to do something tonight and do something before this year is over. I want you to go home and clean out your God closet. Clean out your God closet. Get all of the junk and the trash from years past, and you need to start your life over. Reinvent yourself with the essentials that would always lead you to the words and the life of Christ and, 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 and put away your own thoughts about what you think. I say in life, we could be happier if we could get, just get past what I thought. Isaiah says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above your ways. When I was at Abilene Christian University, y'all with me tonight? You ain't got to say amen, but just nod your head every now and then, and don't fall asleep to let me know that you're with me tonight. When I was at Abilene Christian University, I had a professor who was a brilliant, in my opinion, theologian, and I remember one day he walked into the classroom and he said, tear up your notes. He said, I've changed my mind. And I wasn't the only student who hoped. I wasn't part of the, uh, an unfortunate group that had just realized that everything we had learned the previous week as a certain truth is no longer true at all. The more you follow God, 
You hear from him and watch him at work and also watch him choose not to speak and act. The greater chances uh, your conception of him will be hidden in the shadows. And over time, as you continue to follow God, you gain a humbler attitude about God, what you say about God. You gain a desire for clarity and simplicity when you speak about God. When you're learning what Jesus means in your life and for the world, class is always in session. So you got to hold your notes loosely and keep the shredder handy. And tonight I want to use for a topic, it's time to tear up your notes. It's time to tear up your notes. See, Jesus' disciples, they catch a lot of flack for being dense and confused even after Jesus tells them plainly what is about to happen to him. Uh, I have great sympathy for those fishermen. Jesus never said, I changed my mind, tear up your notes. But being a student of Jesus had to be a volatile experience of, of a constant uh, changing of your world view. Uh, a lot of notes, previous answers, cultural assumptions and learned uh, presumptions uh, presumptions uh, were going to enter the trash every day. I want you to listen to what a typical lesson would have been like following Jesus. Have you believed that it's wrong to touch a leper? Tear up your notes. How about the strict rules that forbid speaking to a woman in public or allowing her to touch you? Tear up your notes. Do you think you know how to pray? I'm going to show you. Tear up your notes. So you've kept all of the commandments from your youth. Let me tell you one thing you lack. I want you to go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. Tear up your notes. Do you think you know who God loves and who he doesn't love, who God is punishing and who God is reward, rewarding? You might want to check again, tear up your notes. And I think in the church, we think that we're better than the lady who's walking on the corner. You think God loves you better than a drug dealer, but I got news for you. God don't love me any better than he loves the drug dealer. Tear up your notes. We ought to lose this attitude as if we're better than other folks because we've been in the church a long time. If I get to heaven and I want to go to heaven, it's not going to be because I preach good sermons. If I get to heaven, it's not going to be how many years I spent in the church of Christ. Uh, if I get to heaven, it's only going to be because of the sacrifice that my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ made. I cannot do it on my own. Tear up your notes. All of my righteousness has got to go out the window when I start really understanding Jesus. That's why we're so judgmental because we really don't understand who Christ is. You thought you were clear on God's attitude toward the Roman occupiers and the other Gentiles. Jews are not allowed to eat with them or go into their homes except uh, them as being righteous unless they become Jews. Sorry, you can throw your notebook away. You think you understand who God loves and Includes who God dislikes and ignores? Do you know who is in and who is out of God's kingdom? Do you know who is the greatest in the kingdom? Then answers, and Jesus gave them answers, and, and I think Jesus, his answers bear little resemblance to what a righteous or right-thinking Jew of that day would have thought. But he taught them based upon what, uh, not based upon what they had been taught, but what they needed to be taught. And that's what needs to go on in the church today. Uh, we've got to teach what needed to be taught. We've got to teach what Jesus says and not our opinion, not what we think, not what we feel. Uh, I remember one particular time uh, in a class, and, and my job as the evangelist is to, is to defend the word and to stay with the word. I have authority with the word. And one time one of our old elders said something in class, and he said, I don't think this and that. And I had to correct him and say, brother, is that the Bible or your opinion? Because I don't care who you are in the church, none of us lead or guide the church based upon our opinion. And none of our opinions are bigger than the word of God. And, and, and why are we arguing about it if it's in the word of God? And many of the doubtful disputes, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 14, uh, which divide the church are just that. It's my opinion versus your opinion. It doesn't do anything to build up the church. And what Satan wants to do in the church, he wants to divide and conquer. Uh, just like in 1 Corinthians, he wants you to say, I am of Holmes and I am of Hawkins and I am of Thompson. Christ is not divided. And where there is no unity, there will be no peace. And unless there is peace, there cannot be unity. Unity thrives in the 
environment of peace. Just like if countries want to sign treaties, we got to stop shooting bullets at each other. That needs to be a ceasefire in the church. We need to sit down at the table of brotherhood. When I got back to Dallas, y'all probably heard about it. There's a lot of stuff going on in Dallas. We had some brethren who came in, and they wanted their own stuff. Divided the church. We got, and they asked me, who are you with? You with us or them? I said, I ain't with nobody. I'm with Jesus. We got gangs in the church. Who you rolling with? I'm rolling with Christ. I'm not on one side or the other. And we go, they got their own breakfast. And then they say, these are the sound brothers. And these are not the sound brothers. And we're going to write a letter on you because you don't disagree. I said, I can write a letter too. I know half the stuff you're talking about is no biblical fact to it. But I can write a letter on you about division. Huh. It's wrong to cause division in the church. Man. Just because you don't agree with and half the folks in the church that have a problem with things they don't even have biblical back and they don't even know what scripture they can back up why they feel the way they feel I don't know so and so just told me that. that's, what, that's what brother so and so told me but let me tell you something brother so and so can be wrong uh, he's human too and brother so and so sometimes just passed down what somebody else told him but when you start studying the word of God and really getting into the word of God you start tearing up your notes Y'all remember, I, I said this back home, I remember the first time my, my mom wore pants to church. And that, that used to be a sin for some of y'all, right? For a sister to wear pants to church. And I said, Mama, you got on pants? She said, yeah, it's cold out here. <laughs> and sometimes you get tired of that shit, then where is that sin? You, know, you thought that was a sin. You thought everything's a sin. Sin, 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 sin. And we've sinned a lot of folks out of the church. That's it. That's it. That stuff wasn't a sin. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to move on tonight. Uh, by the time Jesus came to earth, I'm almost there. By the time Jesus came to earth, the Jews had already known God for a thousand years. They had seen God create them as a mighty nation. God had taken care of them through the good times and the bad, even going through the trouble of rescuing, rescuing them out of slavery in Egypt to preserve them as a people. He gave them their own homeland, defeated their enemies. The Jews knew all about the heavy religious subjects and uh, they knew uh, about redemption and blood sacrifice and the necessity of the blameless paying the blood price for those worthy of blame. They knew this. It was in the Old Testament. It was prophecy. They, they knew all about forgiveness and salvation. They had received the Ten Commandments directly from God. They were the world's first people to insist that there was one creator, God. They knew the truth about God, and they repeated uh, his stories, his exploits down through the years about God. And they, 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 Every year during the most important religious observance, the Passover, they, 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 they commemorated in a sense, and then a man arrived who claimed to be the king who the nation of Israel had been waiting on for centuries uh, and I believe that the Jews knew exactly what a king especially a king from God was supposed to do he was supposed to destroy Israel's enemies rescue the nation from humiliation clean up politics and religion bring the kingdom of God uh, quite a list and every Jew in every village knew the Messiah's job description imagine that you're Matthew or John or Peter you're familiar with the Passover uh, meal and your people have been celebrating for more than 1,000 years. The one that commemorates the Jews' deliverance from Egypt. And Jesus says to you, I got a new explanation to give you. And I think you're going to be surprised. He ex then explained to them that there was a new lamb in town. And animal sacrifices and uh, temple services were no longer sufficient to atone the people's sin. Someone else's blood is going to save you, and it's mine. The truth, as a disciple had been taught all their lives, was suddenly recast and fulfilled by a man who acted like a god and reversed every expectation these men had always had of what God was supposed to be like. Jesus wouldn't leave their ideas of God alone until he was their ideal of God. 
I like the Gospel of John because the Gospel of John, uh, it exemplifies the deity of Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John 1.14 said, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten, full of what? Grace and in truth. He's the high priest. Uh, who knows our infirmities. He knows exactly how you feel tonight. And I used to think, and I told you I'm a recovering legalist, and I used to think that God was sitting up in heaven waiting for my every move to mess up, to send a lightning, a lightning bolt from heaven to strike me down, but I don't see God like that anymore. I see God as a God who loves me. I see God as a God who is my father. He's my daddy. I talk to him like my daddy. When I pray, I don't get fancy with it. Our oh, father who was in heaven, the one who hung the sky in a star like diamonds on a black velvet. You know, talk to God like he's your daddy. Yeah. The Bible says he knows what you need yeah. even before you ask him. Yeah. Sometimes I got to go say, daddy, I messed up. <laughs> daddy, I'm in trouble. You know what I need. And the spirit understands the groanings. Even when I can't get the words together, God knows. So funny that that the people, you can't see Christ for getting past the Christians. There are people that are hurting, but they can't get past and penetrate our systems that are in place to marginalize the downtrodden. I read somewhere that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. Some of us are tougher than Jesus. How are you gonna be tougher than Jesus? I can imagine the wild ride it must have been to be around Jesus. People who loved God and sought to obey him found their deepest beliefs about God. They were suddenly revolutionized by what they experienced with Jesus. Old certainties vanished. Undeniable new realities appeared and everything changed. Through the Gospel of John, you see it. Before Abraham was, I am. You search the scriptures and in them you think that you have eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. Imagine when he said, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of the blood, you have no life in you. Remember when the woman in John chapter 9, one of my favorite texts, she was caught in the very act of adultery. And they drug the woman uh, in front and this, they made a scene out of it. And, and we always ask, where was the man? You know, that's how we do it, church. We only drag one party. But where was the other party? The Bible says she was caught in the very act. No speculation, no rumor, and they brought her to Jesus. And they, they, the Bible says they did that to trick him. Uh, and, 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 and I think, uh, I think this is one of the most brilliant discourses in, in, in human literature. Most br brilliant responses you'll ever see to a, a trap. Uh, and the Bible says they dragged him forth. Now Jesus knew if Jesus said stone the woman, they would have they been, what about this grace and mercy that you're talking about? If Jesus said, let her go, what about this law that, 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 that's in place that you want to disagree with? They brought the woman, and Jesus, he, 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 he went on the ground, and he wrote. Somebody says, what did he write? Stop adding stuff. We don't know what he wrote. <laughs> but if I was going to add, maybe grace happens here. <laughs> maybe I'm tired of fooling with these folks. Maybe they don't understand what it means. To have it. And, he, and he got up, and he said, he who is without sin... Now, if he would have said, he who has not committed adultery, there would have still been some that would have been able to stand there and throw the stone. But because he is the great equalizer, that no one can stand righteous before him, because if James said, if you're guilty at one point, you're guilty of them all. So he said, from the oldest, because see, longer you've been around, longer stuff you got on your rap sheet. Some of y'all like, what's wrong with these young people? What was wrong with you 30 years ago? You was wearing hot pants. Somebody said, well, they doing selfie. You was doing Polaroids, just taking pictures and, 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 and shaking it and mailing it. You had a lot of activity going on before you got married. You might have been in the streets. You didn't always love the Lord like you do now. 
They had to drop their stones. And then Jesus says, woman, where are your accusers? And I say that's the same message to the church ought to be preaching today. Where are your accusers? He said in Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no more condemnation. And we ought to get that condemnation. He says, he says uh, but, but listen to this, Jesus did not condone the sin, but he didn't condemn the woman. See, that's the Christ way. Well, we do not condone sin, but we don't condemn the woman. In other words, the gospel taught right, preached right, ought to be about restoration. That's why Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, brethren, if you see your brother overtaken in a fault, ye which are what? Spiritual. Such a one in the what? Spirit of meekness. Because you say, that could have been me right there. That could have been me. All of us are just one bad decision away from being a person that you wouldn't recognize. Yeah, yeah, stop judging folks. Well, they out there robbing. Well, you might be out there too robbing if you'd have. She's sliding down a pole. Well, I, you know, I ain't, I ain't for sliding down a pole, but you throwing your money at her. <laughs> and talking about her sliding down the pole. That's how we do in church. That's how we do. I'm sorry. I thought I was back at home. I'm sorry. Just one second. And he saw, but he told her, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. I'm not condoning your, your, your behavior, but there's no one in here that can judge you. I say this where I preach all the time. If we were to put on this big high definition 1080 uh, 4K screen up here, if we could replay back uh, some moments in your life, one by one, we would get the finger up and walk out like this because you got some stuff that you are afraid of and ashamed of in the church before you became a Sunday school teacher, before you were involved in the bus ministry, before you centered the table, you've got some stuff too. We've got people afraid to enter into our churches because they think we're too perfect for them. Gospel is for the sinner, for the fractured man. Savior is frustrated with our level involvement with the system, how we even treated our sinners. Can you imagine? Jesus said, do you want to be made whole? You've been laying in the same place a long time. If you want to be made whole, take up your bed and walk. And, and we knew the man was made whole. Jesus, when he, Jesus found him in the temple, he knew he had changed. And Jesus told him, you know, basically, be careful or something worse is going to happen to you. Uh, but, but he says, except a man. In John chapter 3, he told Nicodemus. Can you imagine how profound this must have been uh, to, to, to Nicodemus when he said, except a man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Remember in John chapter 4 when he approached a woman, a Samaritan woman, uh, in the middle of the day at the well. And he said, if you knew who it was who was asking you for a drink, you would have asked him for a drink and he would have given you living water. Then he also says in that same chapter, the hour is going to come when you shall not worship on this mountain or in Jerusalem, but true worship First shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. I say that all the time. There is nothing holy about this building that we are in right now. This is not the sanctuary. We have people fight on back home. There's people arguing about we can't have a fellowship hall connected to the church building. We can't eat in the building. Well, you know what we do? We have a big old, we got a big old scream up there. One night for our married couples, we had movie night in the auditorium. And we had popcorn. <laughs> oh, some people had to cook them sacred cows. Like, it, it was hard for them. Hey, sacred cows make the best hamburgers. Them sacred cows, and nothing was harm, no, no harm, no foul. We had a great time. We were in the building, the auditorium, which God blessed us with. When we had that tornado, we had to shut half of the building down. We had boxes all in the building. God, you, God gave us this stuff to use it, and we only use it uh, as we choose to use it. It's a building. If our building were to burn down today, we could go meet in a hotel. We could go meet in a field. We could go meet in somebody's house. Because what he was trying to teach us in John chapter 4, it ain't about a particular place. He says it, it's about the spirit. God is, some of y'all come every Sunday and you, you come to the building, but you never come to worship. Matter of fact, I tell people all the time, they say, we need to call to worship. You need to get, do something or say something to bring us into worship, get us focused. I said, you should have been focused when you got here. 
Matter of fact, I don't wait to church to get out and worship God every single day of my life. I worship him riding along in the street. I worship him when I wake up in the morning. This is just a collective gathering where we can do it together. Oh, we, we think we, we jump holy when we get in the building. As soon as y'all get in the car after church, y'all fight. Y'all fought all the way here. And then y'all fight all the way home. But you look good in your church hat. You got the prettiest nails in the congregation. Baby hair laid down, you looking good. But inside, there's no holiness. There's no righteousness. There's no real joy. You sing and you shout. And when you go out, you live a defeated life. This is what happens where I am. You don't know how to worship God in spirit and in truth. I told y'all last night, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to say these things. He says, uh, he says this man's, remember John chapter 9, uh, when, when they said, uh, we asked this question, like, whose fault is it that this man was born blind? Jesus said it wasn't this man nor his parents' sin, but cause was for the glory of God that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Imagine when Jesus says, I am the door. I am the good shepherd. No man takes my life from me, but I lay it down. And if I lay it down, I have the power to take it up again. And this commandment I have received from my father. Remember when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever believes in me shall never die. Tear up your notes. If you have seen me and heard me, you have seen and heard God, tear up your notes. If I be lifted up from the earth, I'm going to draw all men unto me. Tear up your notes. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples by the love that you have one toward another. Tear up your notes. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me in my Father's house. There are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have not told you so. Tear up your notes. He told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. And if while my kingdom was of this world, then my servants would fight that I should not be delivered as the Jews. And, and Pilate said, are you a king? Jesus said, yes, you are right in saying that I'm a king. Matter of fact, to this end I was born. For this cause I came into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. And everyone that hears my voice is of the truth. Being a disciple of Jesus, I'm moving toward a close. Y'all still with me tonight? Being a disciple of Jesus meant that you had joined a demolition party aimed at everything you had ever believed about God. Jesus was a radical. Jesus didn't fit in with society. And I learned sometimes in order to be like him, I can't fit in all of the time. I, I might not sound like everybody else. I might have some more compassion and some more grace and some more mercy, but also preaching the unadulterated truth about who God is and what he desires of every man. Many of us need to reevaluate our views about the Lord. <coughs> God will send you to hell. Let's be correct with that. But that's always our leading point. That's our favorite thing. You going to hell. You go, like we want folks to go to hell. Y'all going to hell. Everybody else is going to hell for us. We said that's the gospel. But where's the love in our gospel? Where's the grace in our gospel? Where's the forgiveness in our gospel? Where is that? Where's the mercy? Do we teach about the true Jesus and what we try to do before we get him to Christ? We want to get him to our system. I say this where I am all the time. A person can learn along the way while we, while we commune on the first day of the week and while we don't have instruments and music and while we don't have women preach. Those things they will learn along the way. You don't start off on meat. You start off on milk. You, you, you go through a process. And some of us think we're on, uh, on ribeye when we're really on placenta. Because we equate our years at a church or years in the church. See, somebody, think about it. That some of us think the same thing. They think because, some of us think because we're old, we're, that makes us wise. There's some gray-haired fools. Wisdom does not come with age. Wisdom comes with God. 
And we, we parade that around. I, 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 I'm, I'm talking about where I am now. I'm, I'm just venting a little bit, and I, I hope this is not on the way. <laughs> uh, but, but it's on there. <laughs> but, but I've been in the church 35 years, and I want to say, who cares? Yeah. Right? Yeah. What have you done for anybody? Uh, you haven't taught a Bible class. We haven't gone into the streets. We're not going into the highways and byways, reaching those folks. Uh, you've attended a lot of programs, but, but what have you produced? What's your fruit? And you're only as good, and I learned this in coaching, you're only as good as your last performance. You know, I, I, it's like me going home each Sunday night, and I say, oh, I killed it. I did it. It don't matter what I did uh, last Sunday. I got to produce next week. And my grandmother used to tell me, don't shout too hard when you win. And don't cry too hard when you lose. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And because we celebrate too much, uh, the, you know, there's going to come a down moment in our life and a down time. But if we're too down, we've got to get back up uh, and we've got to stay on it. And as I move toward my close tonight, I want you to know that all of us as followers of Christ, we've been given, we've been given a, a mission to remove all of our idols, repent and renew our minds and reform our, our lives. And I think many of us uh, have been raised under a false religion, which I call churchianity. Our whole lives and perspectives about Christ and his church were formed in the four walls of the building. Uh, all of us have got to examine our lives. We should be wearing warning signs that say, beware. I'm an ongoing theological deconstruction and reconstruction zone. Many of us have spent this whole year, 2018 is almost over, you've been an auto, autopilot where the standard shifts from living like Jesus to just being a good Christian. See, we compare ourselves among ourselves, and Paul says in doing so, we are not wise, and we like to say, I'm better than you, or at least I haven't done this or I haven't done that. Let me tell you something, Brother Godbold, I love him to death, but Brother Godbold is not my standard. I love Brother Daniels, but Brother Daniels is not my standard. Dr. Holmes is not my standard. Brother Stokes is not my standard. My standard is Christ Jesus. And once I make Christ my standard, I realize that I still got a long way to go. I still got a lot to learn. I still got to humble myself and I still got to let him grow me and bring me along to allow me to become the man that I need to be. If Christ, Paul can say that I have not attained, not perfect, but one thing I've got to do if I'm going to gonna gain Christ, I've got to be able to put those things behind me and press toward the mark of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. And we see tonight that uh, my experience is that Jesus shakes me up because I can't get it together on my, my own. Sometimes while reading the Gospels, I think that I can miss the point, and we all do at times. I believe many of us uh, are like that uh, Laodicea, that lukewarm church that made Jesus vomit. You're not even, you're not hot and you're not cold. And some of us are like that, we're just there. You're not on fire, but you show up. Uh, and I think it'd be better for some of us just to stay home uh, because all you're doing is taking up space in the way. No enthusiasm, no fire no passion and I've learned that one or two people can start a movement that's why where I am I am the number one cheerleader yeah I, I believe that if I can stay on fire then maybe somebody else will stay on fire and believe it or not people are looking at you when they're singing somebody's looking at you everybody is not singing this morning isn't that a shame that we have to say everybody's not singing this morning you got food in your refrigerator. Somebody says, why should I sing? You got up in the morning. Yes, sir. I got put one foot in front of the other. That says I ought to sing. Yeah. Somebody says, why should I give? You got up and you had a roof over your head and you knew who you were. That says you ought to give. Yeah. But we've got to coax everybody. We've got to give people incentive to do anything. If my mom and daddy left the church, I still going to stay with God because I know too much about them now. He's done too much for me now. I can't leave him now even if I wanted to because I'm a slave to righteousness and you're going to be a slave to something in your life, a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness and he got a hold on me now and I can't let go of him even if I wanted to. 
Uh, when you grow in the faith, it's, you stop worrying about what folks think about you and what folks say about you and how they're sizing uh, you up. What I need is, I, I, need, to, I need a Jesus uh, and, a, and a God that, that changes my mindset. I need a personal transformation by the real Christ. Not the one that has been manufactured and organized Christianity. I need to be changed by the Jesus who agrees to never be quiet or cooperative with the world. I need to be around some folks who want to resist uh, culture, who understand that we must change our methodology while maintaining our method. I believe that Jesus' followers who have taken the same uh, uh, view of, re of religion, I need some folks to step up. We talk about courage. We need to denounce some of these religious phonies that are out here. Trying to make disciples of themselves. Do you ever find yourself tonight as I come to my clothes, feel like you're swimming in a sea of mediocrity? Do you ever feel like there's got to be more to this it got to be more to life than just getting up, paying bills. It's got to be more to the church than just coming on Sunday morning, singing a few songs. It's got to be more to this thing called ministry. It's got to be more than this. Uh, I, need, I, need, I need to read and hear the Bible taught with the passionate integrity of Jesus. Not with manipulation, not with misrepresentation of modern Christian life. I need truthful talk, not scripted chit-chat. I think sometimes in church, we are obsessed with how we sound in presen presenting the lesson, the brother man of God. And so I, I understand homiletics and hermeneutics and all that, but, but, but where I am, I got to deal with folks where I have to use ain't, <laughs> and I got to tell it to them just like they, 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 they don't want to know uh, in the Greek with so-and-so. They just want to tell me like it is. Help my life. I, I go through the Greek, but you don't have to go through my whole process of why I got to where I got. All you need to do is hear what God has said for you. Sometimes we go over people's head. The lesson sounded good, but it didn't penetrate the heart. I could use a lot of big words. We could do that. I could get up here and I could get going on and down in a rhythm. Ah, uh, he helped Joshua fight the battle of Jericho. Uh, yeah, I could get on that. I could get on a roll. We trained to do that. We can do that. But after you shout, and after you get out of your seat, I can make you shout. But does it change your life? Does it make you want to live better? And you've got to be careful uh, to guard your or to be aware of your spirit. Because some of us, our spirits have been seared. Mm. Conscious have been seared. Uh, where it no longer moves us. No, things no longer touch us. We no longer see that. that we no pricked by the word of God. As I was saying last night, words don't touch us anymore because we become satisfied with where we think we are in Christ. Mm. And, and this is something that, again, Brother Bowers used to say all the time. Unless you heard him say, well done, that means you haven't done well. <laughs> And I use that. Have you, any of us said, well, have you heard him say, well done? You ain't made it yet. Ain't no such thing as I'm a better Christian than them. I tell people all the time, I'm not better than you, but sometimes I have to tell you I'm better than that. Yeah, 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 I'm, I'm better than that. And, I, and you ought to let, let anybody take you out of a place where you understand the word of God. I want to go to a place where I'm allowed to raise my questions. I'm allowed to raise my hands in praise. Where I can verbalize my struggles. A place where I can mess up and be prayed for instead of being talked about. Oh, I want to be able to stumble and be, still be accepted as part of the team. Yeah, she come down here every week, so let her come down here every week. You need to come down here every week, and God knows that. Let her come. If you're going to talk about her, uh, then uh, talk about her. But, 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 but if you're talking about her, you only should be talking about her to figure out how you can help her. I need to see and know that there are real human beings who walk the path of hard choices and hard times and remain faithful to Jesus. I need friends who pray like Jesus, who step across lines to include outcasts. I need fellow students who hold the ancient faith of the church in their minds and the mission of Jesus Christ in their hearts. I need leaders who don't think they're above me or, or who want me to worship at the altar of their authority. 
I don't need confirmation or confrontation all the time in the church. I need family and fellowship. I need brothers and sisters who will start with me on my journey, encourage me along the way, and keep a map where I can see it, and we can talk about our struggles together, and we can increase one another's faith. And tonight, if you're going to trade in your false gods for the great God and the great Savior, Jesus Christ, I believe that we, we can do that and radically shape congregations. Words like progression and, and radicalism, they, they, they make us nervous. They make us nervous because they bring us, as I said last night, out of our, out of our, out of our comfort zones. And, and I guarantee you tonight, uh, a lot of these congregations are dying because, and I said this uh, a few, few weeks ago, uh, a great mariner, a great sailor, uh, he or she does not adjust the sails, don't change, they don't change the sails just for the sake of it. Uh, there's already been a change in the atmospheric conditions. They don't change just for the sake of change. They change because change has already occurred. And that's what great leaders do. There's, there's no way that a good leader sees that something's... Matter of fact, good leaders are already anticipating. You're already anticipating the change in the climate. And, and, and the leaders anticipate it, but the members have got to anticipate that as well. You've got to... Somebody, when is somebody going to see, not just in, in Figueroa or Cedar Valley, when are we going to see in the church that we're losing a lot of our young people? And we're going on as if it's business as usual, saying, well, it's just them, these young folks today, uh, they're just losing it, and nobody's asking the questions, why? And I imagine the only way you would get the answers is actually go talk to some of them and listen to them. And I guarantee nine times out of ten, eight times out of ten, it was the fact that somebody said something to them. They weren't included. I said this where I was telling the class today, we got several deacons who are in their 30s with families. And, and, and they're, they're in the development process, ongoing training process. And our elders are four, four of them, they're getting old. But when, when they get ready to move out, we ought to be able to slide those deacons right in. Why do they got to wait till they're 50 before they can serve in, in the kingdom? These guys are attorneys and, and businessmen and, and they're making headwaves all in society. When they come to church, they're on the back burner. I told myself I was tired of being the youngest person in the business meeting. There's ideas that we got. I can be respected everywhere else but in the church. Isn't that funny? My age don't mean nothing nowhere else but in the church. I tear up your notes. It ought to look something like that. I'm going to go ahead and tear mine up. We ought to go home and say, I thought, I thought all of this stuff. I got to go back to the table about my life. This ain't working right now. I'm tearing it up. I'm tearing it up. And I want to start following Christ. I got to get back in the gospel. I got to get back in the word. And I got to make sure what I believe is what the Lord is teaching. And not just what I heard or what I thought or what I feel. You can't, we can't lead the church and move the church by feeling an opinion. The word of God is still, it'll still grow a church. The word of God will still move the people. But the people have got to be, but I've got to receive that. Uh, and in, 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 in Mark chapter 3, Mark chapter 3, remember Jesus healed the man with the withered hand? And, and the man, the Bible says that when Jesus came into the synagogue, they watched him. They didn't watch him to see, uh, you know, see what great miracle he was going to do in order to, to follow him or to celebrate him. They watched him, the Bible says, in order to accuse him. The man with the deformity, he had to, I can imagine that he had, uh, the Bible says it was his right hand. Luke's account said it was his right hand. But I imagine uh, that uh, a lot of people in the church are like that. Uh, they have deficiencies, deformities that they got to hide. They got to hide because they aren't accepted. And Jesus came and told the man to stretch out his hand, and he, and he healed him. He healed him. And I believe he still wants to heal a lot of folks that are among us. But, but, but I'm just afraid that our systems are in the way, and our systems don't allow for growth. Our systems don't allow the church to flourish, don't allow the church to move, because we've got to remove some of those blocks. And again, what worked in 1960? See, as I was watching those videos, you got to understand what was going on in the 60s. There was a whole cultural 
uh, historical, racial, society. There was a movement going on. It, it was a different time. And, 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 and folks were flocking to churches all over. There was a lot of things that were different that I don't even have time to get into than they are now. Think about it. As, how many of you are like me? Like, I really don't like social media, but I have to get with it. <laughs> I have to get with it. And I had a young lady in church say, Brother Bailey, you need to get with your social media. And so I said, what, do you, what does that mean? She said, you need to post stuff even when you don't want to post. So I said, I'm going to start uh, posting a quote every day. And then I noticed that post, it, it gets a fall. Then I noticed I can get announcements out there and I can do a lot of stuff better. I said, we got to up our YouTube. We got to get our Instagram together. We got to get on Snapchat. <laughs> and as much as I hate to do all of this stuff, the kids love it. The youth love it. They feel like they are involved. Come tell us what y'all need. Come tell us what you want. Come tell us what we can do to reach out to you and minister to you. Yeah. You've got to tear, tear up your notes. Tear up your notes. I, I, I'm done to tonight. You know, when you, when you got, I went to say this last night, when you got somebody on your side, when you know you got some firepower behind you, and that's the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit, do not underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit in a place to move the place, to shake the place up. Somebody says, we need to be revived at, at Figueroa. It's going to happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. But the power of the Holy Spirit just can't be in the ministers. It just can't be in the elders. It's got to be in the members. It's got to be among the body. Uh, you ought to be a buzz. I say that where I am every Sunday morning when people walk in that building, they ought to feel a buzz in that building. They ought to feel an energy in that place that something is happening here that's even bigger than what we're about to do in worship. It's people that love one another. It's people that love Jesus. It's people that are accepting of the people who walk in off the street and don't smell like you and look like you. I, I can't love you and be afraid of you at the same time. Don't let this suit fool you. I don't have to preach in this suit. I can preach in flip-flops and a dashiki. I know that. I only preach in a suit and tie because I choose to, but it's not a sin if I don't. That's right. And if I preached in a t-shirt tonight, could you still hear my message? <laughs> if I had jeans on tonight, would that cause you to stumble? You'd be surprised the stuff that causes people to stumble. Uh, in the church. I told people at the time, they say, well, <coughs> Christmas is coming up. And I know some ministers are afraid for Christmas trees and stuff because they're members. I said, I said, listen, you come to my house on Christmas, it's going to be a Christmas tree up. Yes, sir. It's going to be lights, yes, sir. decorations, yes, sir. presents, yes. the whole nine yards. And somebody said, you don't know when Jesus' birthday is. I, listen, it's just the time of the year. So you mean you don't barbecue on the 4th? <laughs> what you celebrating? <laughs> oh, so you only give thanks on the 4th Thursday of, th uh, 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 of uh, November? You can find a lot of stuff to be critical about. I don't do it. So my thing is this. If you don't like Christmas, then don't come to my house because you're going to stumble over these decorations. And I, I learned this. I, well, I, I told my kids, I will not do that. It's, isn't it funny how we put all these things on the leaders and preachers' kids? But your family, you can do everything. You can have Christmas, but they can't. I watch rated R movies. Can I still preach tomorrow and say that? I like. Y'all don't, don't like rated R movies? How many of y'all seen Coming to America? And don't lie. How many times have you, how many times, how many of you have seen it more than five times? <laughs> that means you done heard a lot of cuss words. <laughs> and you done watched some killing and some shooting and some inappropriate sin. Stop acting like that. I believe we, we begin to grow in the church when we begin to move our halos. Y'all know y'all cuss. Oh, I just do it occasionally. Y'all drink, do everything else. And then we get here, oh, I'm just in highly favored. I know the truth. We know the truth. Everybody knows the truth. And if we could stop all that faking in the church and be real, we could bring some folks in. And we could help some folks. And instead of being ashamed of what you've done, you ought to be able to say, I've been saved by the blood of the Lord. I used to be this, and Christ saved me. And you can really help somebody.
I need to hear it from a couple who went through some struggles and said, we made it because we talked to God about it. Oh, we ain't never had an argument. You lying. <laughs> oh, I've never done, I've never even thought a bad thing. We about to tear up some notes on you. When you can be real, people can connect to you. Connect to you. So I say, but, but baby, can I still preach because I listen to some of the same stuff y'all listen to? Does that, do I get angry sometimes? Do I get frustrated sometimes? Can you still be your leaders when they're frustrated? It's after the sermon uh, before said, it's okay to, to be okay. What if I come in today and I have an off day? It's okay. And maybe I looked your way. Maybe I had so much going on in my mind. Maybe I didn't mean to not speak to you on purpose. But if we have real love for one another, we'll stop judging one another. We'll stop talking about one another. She got this going down. She got that going down. And oh, she's struggling. Oh, look at her. Look at this. Da, 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 da. So much judgment, so much self righteousness in the church. It, it's, it's really saddening. It's really saddening. Those brothers be out there to my sound doctrine. They be beating on their wives, cheating on their wives, talking about some stay with the word. I'm going home Thursday morning. <laughs> Leave it on that midnight train to Dallas. But when you know you got somebody backing you up, when you got some firepower, you're not worried about anything. And that's what I was saying yesterday. Y'all got the power of the Holy Spirit in this place. And you can move forward with the power. There, there was a story as I close tonight, as I close, and they say, uh, I'm, uh, as a, as the longer I preach, Brother Hawkins, I have about three closings. Uh, so this is my third closing, <laughs> third and final closing. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, there was a story of a cop pulled over this woman, and an older woman, and uh, she was swerving a little bit, and so he pulled over, and he walked up to the window. Uh, she uh, let down her window, and he said, um, he looked in the window, and he saw that she had a, a nine millimeter in her purse. So he was kind of curious. He said, ma'am, do you have any more weapons in your vehicle? She said, yes, sir. I have a 22 in the console, a 45 in the glove box, and a shotgun in the trunk. Mm. And the officer was puzzled, and he looked up, and he, he got concerned. He said, ma'am, what are you afraid of? She looked up at him with a smirk on her face. She said, not a doggone thing. <laughs> not a duck. Li listen, when you got some heat, <laughs> see, y'all... <laughs> Y'all think some people are quiet because they weak. But sometimes you're quiet because you know you're packing. You know? you know you got some power. But when you got the Holy Ghost power behind you, you ain't got nothing to worry about. And I, I know we ain't talking about that type of heat, but I got some real heat behind me. I got some dynamite. I ain't worried about none of that stuff. Not a thing. So I said, what you worried about tonight, Sam? Not a thing. Because I got some heat. It's called Holy Ghost dynamite. Real power that can transform. When the apostles received the power of the Holy Spirit, the church began to move. It's a spirit thing. It ain't a structural thing. It ain't a money thing. It's a faith thing. It's a spirit thing. If you want Figueroa to be revived, ask God to revive yourself. Ask God to revive you. He'll work on everybody else. Ask God to revive me. Creating me a clean heart and renew the right spirit within me. I've said enough tonight. If you're here tonight, you not obey the gospel of Christ. You come by hearing the word, Romans 10, 17. Faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You've got to believe what you heard, Hebrews 11 and 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You must confess, uh, you must repent of your sins, Luke 13 and 3. Jesus said, except you repent, you shall also likewise perish. Matthew 10, 32, you must confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. In Mark 16, verse number 16, Jesus said it out of his own mouth. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Galatians 3, 27, as many of us have been baptized, baptized into Christ have now put on Christ. 
And we have a relationship with Christ. You ought to grow in Christ. And I encourage you, uh, even in those who got wet, but you haven't grown in your relationship with Christ, I, I, I encourage you to go back and re-examine the Christ of the Bible. And, and find a relationship with him and find that he's long-suffering. He says, I'm meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest uh, to, in your soul. If you're weary in your soul tonight, if you're restless in your spirit, it's because you've been dealing with church folks too much. you got to get back and find the Christ who transformed your soul, who can change your spirit, who can elevate your praise, who can reconstruct your life. And maybe you're here tonight and you need prayer, maybe because you've got too many notes that you've written over the years, uh, too many personal transcripts, too many opinions that's getting in the way of you not only seeing Christ, but you getting in the way of seeing anybody else. Maybe you're here tonight and maybe you're guilty of self-righteousness, self-elevation, uh, uh, self uh, self-perpetuation. Uh, uh, maybe you are uh, just, just, just thinking in your mind that you've arrived and that you've made it. I hope we go home tonight with the spirit of humility, realizing that if we are anything, it's only because of the blood of Christ. And that Christ continue to make us, Christ continue to grow us. Uh, there's still more left, as I said last night, there's still more left in the tank. There's a better version of you that is yet, not yet to be achieved, but it's only going to come through a deeper relationship with Christ. Deeper relationship with Christ. Whatever may be your case, before we dismiss tonight, let us stand and sing a song of encouragement. Somebody's knocking at your door. Knocking well, at somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, 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 oh well, oh, 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 sinner, now why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody. He's knocking at your door. Well, somebody knocking at your door. Door, well, oh, said, Well, now I don't you answer. Somebody's knocking at your door. Well, knocks like Jesus, somebody's knocking at your door, I said he knocks like Jesus, somebody's knocking at your door, oh, Somebody's knocking at your door. Well, uh, he can save you. Somebody's knocking at your door. I said he can save you. Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Well, he can save you. Somebody's knocking at your door. Well, I said he can save you. Somebody's knocking at your door. Well, oh, oh, say, tell me why don't you have somebody at your door? Pass me not, oh, Jim, to save me, Lord, hear my home. Oh, cry, what is cry? Will and why? While on the first night, I call all in. Lord, do, do not pass me. I'm calling you, Savior, Savior. Now why don't 
to him I, I humble cry Yeah, Lord, and wild, wild on the earth There were claws all in Oh, do, do not pass me Let your church say amen. Once again, God has blessed us with a powerful, powerful word tonight through the presence of Brother Sam Bailey. I'm going to ask that you continue to pray for Sam and his spiritual life and his spiritual understanding of God's word. I'm going to ask that you continue to pray for his wife, Lori. Pray for them. Pray for the congregation that he preaches at in Dallas. That he will remain focused, speak God's word with spirit and in truth. We have two to respond to the Savior's invitation. When I call your name, I'm going to ask that you raise your hand that the congregation will recognize who you are. First, we've got uh, Devonna Johnson. Devonna states that she has sinned and she is repenting of those sins. She also states that she's five months pregnant and uh, I'm sad and I'm pretending I'm fighting through trials and tribulations that she's going through. She says that she is tired of going through these hard times and she asks in the church to pray for her that God can lift her through these pains and take these pains off of her. So I'm going to ask that you pray for her, Devana. We have Sister Andrea Major. Sister Major, she's come down asking for a traveling grace for her father. Brother Andrew Major is leaving tonight, and she's asking that you pray for her dad, that uh, God will have mercy upon him, and that he will arrive in the Bahamas with a safe uh, trip back home. He, uh, she's also asking for prayers for her brother uh, and her spiritual sister. At this time, we're going to ask the church to bow their heads as we go to Heavenly Father in prayer on the behalf of these two individuals and remember their prayer requests. Father God in heaven, we come bow before you at this time. Once again, giving all thanks, praises unto you. And thank you, Heavenly Father, for the many, many blessings of life that you bestowed upon us. We come bow before you at this time. Thank you, Lord. Special prayers for Brother Sam Bailey and his spirit and his understanding of the word. We pray, Father, that you will continue to be with him, help him to remain a hard-fighting soldier, help him, O oh Lord, to stand in the pulpit to preach your word with spirit and understanding. We pray, Heavenly Father, special prayers for his family as well. Be with them, O oh Lord, as they continue to fight this battle, walking down this pathway of life. We come bow before you at this time, O oh Lord, on behalf of our own sister, Devana, we ask you, Heavenly Father, that you will forgive her of sins that she has committed. And pray, Heavenly Father, to, for the trials and tribulations that she is going through at this time. She states that she's pregnant, and we pray, Father, that you will be with her and help her, Father, through these hard times that she is going through. We ask you, Heavenly Father, special prayers for Brother Andrew Major on behalf of his daughter who came down and asked for prayers for him. We pray, Father, that as he traveled tonight, we pray, Father, that you will bless them with a safe destination back to the Bahamas. We pray special prayers, Heavenly Father, for Andrea. We pray, Heavenly Father, for her spirit. And we pray, Father, that you will continue to guide her and help her, O oh Lord, to remain humble. And help her, O oh Lord, to always set her sight on serving you in spirit and in truth. Praying special prayers for her brother, Ben Major, as the trials and tribulation that he go through as well. We pray, Heavenly Father, special prayers for all of us, for we are all going through trials and tribulations. We are all struggling, O oh Lord, and we pray, Father, that you help us to always realize that our strength is in you, to serve you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Heavenly Father, for our attitudes. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the negative energy that we give off sometimes. But we pray, Father, that you help us to always look unto you Look unto you to help us to do those things which are pleasing and acceptable unto you. 
praying pray, special prayers for this great church, praying, Heavenly Father, for these members who fellowship here. We pray, Father, that you help us to get in there and fight this battle of life and help us, Lord, to put you first in our lives. 